Thank you all for your enthusiastic hellos. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Iri Gavan. I am a Communications and Alumni Stories Student Fellow at the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative, or LT, and your moderator for today. Also present here are my colleagues, Jillian Bloomfield, LT Associate Director of Online Program, Abby York, LT Program Administrator, Frederick Adai, Postgraduate Associate, um, Emmy Nicholson, who will also be moderating for the next week. Last week on April 4th, Fred moderated the introductory team of agroforestry as a climate solution. Today's focus is on designing agroforestry for carbon sequestration. Stay tuned for next week's topic, connecting agroforestry projects to the carbon market. And on April 25th, we will be hosting a Q&A session with all of the speakers, providing an opportunity for attendees to ask their pressing questions regarding agroforestry and carbon. Again, we are pleased to welcome you today to the second session of the four-part webinar series titled Agroforestry and Carbon, Addressing Climate Change Through Tree-Based Agriculture in Tropical Regions. This series is brought to you in collaboration with the Yale Center of, for Natural Carbon Capture. Mm. To formally begin today's webinar, we are joined by our speakers who will impart their knowledge and expertise on designing agroforestry for carbon sequestration. Let's virtually give our hands to Azaria Kilimba, the Operations Manager of Carbon Tanzania, Danielle Piotto, Professor and Dean for the University of Southern Bahia, Brazil, and Siko Stortelder, Head of Agroforestry Hub, Rabobank Acorn, Netherlands. This session is divided into four parts. We will begin with a 15-minute presentation by Azaria Kilimba, followed by another 15-minute presentation by Danielle Piotto. Then we will listen to a 25-minute presentation given by Siko Stortelder. Lastly, we will allot 20 minutes time, so prepare your questions until the end of this session. Our speakers have graciously pre-recorded their presentations for broadcast during this session to ensure accessibility with subtitles and eliminate the potential internet connectivity issues. Let us now meet our first speaker of the day. Azaria Kalimba is the Project Operations Manager for Carbon Tanzania, a carbon project developer company working on Red Plus projects with Tanzania's forest communities. His work supports the communities to create value on their community-owned natural resources through sustainable management and the voluntary carbon market. Azaria has long been dedicated to helping forest communities realize the value of their natural resources. Having managed forest conservation and restoration projects with various NGOs such as MCDI, Enable, WWF, and other NGOs in rural Tanzania, enabling communities to benefit considerably from innovative enterprises such as sustainable timber, tourism, and non-timber products. While our team set up the video, Azaria, would you like to open up your camera and microphone to say hello to everyone, to our um, global audience for this session? Hi, everyone. Um, it's quite an interesting session today. Um, I'm very curious to know what comes out from this session, uh, from my presentation, but also from the Q&A session. I'm really ready to hear what the whole world has to say about uh, what we share based on our experiences, but also um, we are also hopefully to know and get uh, the insights from the whole group. Thanks, Harry. So hello everyone, um, my name is Azaria Kilimba and I work for Carbon Tanzania, which is a carbon developer company based in East Africa and we do carbon trading. However, on this uh, day, I will be speaking on designing agroforestry for carbon sequestration. And to begin with, I think um, it's rather important for us to understand some of the key definitions and concepts around these two words clearly. And to begin with, um, 
with agroforestry, and I would say we might not have a clear definition on this, but we'd rather agree on some aspects that are of uh, commonality in every definition you, you get. And this could mean the integration of trees and shrubs into the animal and crop um, farming systems to produce environmental and economical social benefits. So it's, ma it's mainly focusing on practices that involve tree growing within our farming systems. And with carbon sequestration, that's generally a natural or artificial mechanism that allows the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and um, stored into various forms. This could be solid, gas, um, or liquid form. And basically looking at the scenario for our presentation today, um, these uh, mechanisms could be uh, carbon being stored in plants and soil as terrestrial sequestration or commonly people call it as carbon sinks, but also underground, uh, which is geographical sequestration, looking at how fossil fuels have actually been embarked within the ground and um, aspects like diamond, coal, all these are forms of carbon that are actually stored within the um, underground sequestration. But also there's deep sea, uh, deep uh, in ocean sequestration. And this is mainly through what we call um, blue um, sequestration. Um, why are we speaking of agroforestry now and what is the relationship between agroforestry and uh, carbon sequestration? Um, this is basically because agroforestry actually falls within what we call the uh, follow uh, practices under the carbon um, UNFCC categories and the follow stands for agriculture, forestry and uh, land use. Uh, changes, which um, generally from the 2022 UNFCC report, uh, all these act practices do contribute 22% of the global uh, emissions, global greenhouse gases emissions. And out of the 22%, 55% of all these is coming from agriculture specific. And these may, may include uh, practices such as shifting cultiva cultivation, high intensity, large scale farming practices, including animal husbandry, which has uh, contributed to massive increment of methane as a gas, uh, as among um, the main greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So um, as we go, there's a high push and advocation for better uh, agriculture practices, which agroforestry is inclusive as a mechanism to uh, mitigate climate changes, but also uh, support better livelihood with uh, reducing emissions um, over time. So how does agroforest actually fit in this spectrum looking at the climatic changes uh, aspect? Um, Generally, agroforestry falls under the cat category that responds on um, removals of emissions in the atmosphere, which is different from uh, practices such as sustainable forest management, which is more working as a uh, reduction, which uh, mainly works as uh, a mechanism to avoid more emissions, which, which would be coming from um, deforestation activities. But um, agroforestry is considered as a restoration practice that actually uh, is embedded within agricultural systems. And over time, it intends to absorb the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Looking at the graph above, you just you definitely see how the uh, growth within the uh, projects that are undertaking agroforestry actually over time do exceed in the uh, amount of absor absorption of the carbon um, ca carbon amount in the atmosphere. Uh, different from what we're having in the lower graph, which is more from um, how these uh, avoidance are actually growing over time. So these graphs might make sense in the later on um, slides and I mean later on presentation that we'll be having on this series on uh, agroforestry and carbon markets and investments on carbon because um, they, they do have a very big difference in terms of financial investments and their additionality at the end of the day. But uh, all agroforestry project projects, including tree planting, all these are actually accounting to a long, long term uh, investments in reducing these emissions from the atmosphere. Um, so whenever we design um, agroforestry project, there are a number of things that uh, uh, it's important for any developer or any project developer to really consider. And these are vital um, in terms of um, addressing the sustainability, but also looking on how practical any agroforest practice should be done. And um, one of them is the all the land aspect. Again, the aspects of uh, ownership uses, as we know, much of the I like this phrase mostly. Uh, there's no free land for restoration. 
every land that we see is in one way or another actually owned by an individual and it's um it is used for particular purpose and not necessarily to to be um, a restoration project or something to do with agroforestry but embedding the idea of agroforestry within agricultural farms actually should address that lands are owned by people and the design of the project should simply respect that uh, chemistry and bondage between people and their spaces and how you embed the project should, should actually come from the uh, narrative that this space is owned by an individual with a different interest and how you bring them on the platform to understand how uh, the project is going to benefit them is the only way you can have this uh, project uh, quite um, achievable. The second aspect is the, is the social aspect and particularly looking at the local engagement. Again, uh, reflecting back on the land aspect, land ownership and land rights, community and, and people's livelihoods are always a, a center focus on any uh, project that has to address a climatic uh, challenge or also um, any uh, project that has to address an in, environmental conservational uh, prospect. So local livelihoods engaging the local community at the end of the day they are the ones who owns these spaces they're the ones who have the rights to a decision on how land should be used so they have a very huge um, contribution towards um, the design and also the implementation of this uh, project in the long run. Uh, we have experiences of projects that are actually brought by, uh, again, the donor-based engagement where ideas are generated from a different space and they do not uh, consider the local community interest. And over time, these projects have actually disappeared. And um, for sustainability, it's really important to consider the social aspect, the integration of the community uh, interest within uh, project design and implementation of course. Uh, the third aspect is all about species selection uh, and all looking at the concept of um, carbon sequestration. All the uh, species that we do uh, incorporate within um, an agricultural farmland uh, should actually become, should actually uh, be very, very supportive of the agricultural farming system itself. There are some species that can be highly advocated for restoration or planting, but again, do they actually support the generation or growth of uh, a variety of food crops that exist in that place or that farmer is really uh, demanding to, to grow as part of his uh, say in that project? It's really important to understand what kind of species you really want to integrate in this place and whether those species have an additional value apart from, you know, the um, ecological or um, biological importance in the space, but do, can actually, can they actually be compatible to the crop uh, production system that these, um, that the owners of the land actually need in that space. So it's really important to bring in the um, knowledge on these species in particular, we would advocate for indigenous species, but not not all indigenous species support the integ integration of those um, trees and shrubs within agricultural systems. Again, there's a question about financial investment, and this is very um, important to address on the early days because we have also uh, experienced over time like um, investments that are committed on a very short time best, usually ending in between before the results of a particular project are really not attained. And even the owners of these land spaces are not seeing the benefit of the project itself. So it's really important for such support, either it's financial investment being in a um, aid money fin uh, or a funding opportunity to be committed and put on that project for a long term. At, ti at times, these projects do require to about 10 years for tangible results to be attained. And that is a very big aspect for um, projects that only have short-term dedication in the finance of in supporting agroforestry activities. Uh, there's a question about scalability. Again, um, with uh, carbon sequestration, we understand um, it's about how that space actually sequesters a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. A small space will, would usually work for uh, small amounts, and I want to, be, to embed the scalability with the concept of carbon trading as an opportunity and a potential aspect to consider for uh, sustainability in the future. But again, understanding how the carbon markets work, it's all about spaces and how much uh, uh, 
how much amount of carbon that uh, a particular space actually is able to, to sequester over time. So scalability is all about how can we replicate these projects from an individual farm to um, a multiplier effect to a thousand people, a thousand, a thousand farm of, of multiple hectares. That is really important. We have you, the, the project, project design should actually uh, be able to be replicated to a number of uh, farmers who actually see the potential benefits for agroforestry and there is a future sustainability based on the model of how these projects will be. Again, the question about uh, carbon itself, the baseline assessment, the accounting methodologies, all these cumulative results that actually can embed uh, result from um, the, the project itself, it's really important to understand um, what amounts of carbon are actually um, sequestered by a particular project over time. As you know, uh, looking back at that graph, when you see um, from the early on, uh, early on phase, the amount of carbon will be quite small because these species need to grow to a level where they're consuming huge amounts of amounts of carbon, and probably it's uh, it's time that's going to take for uh, five, ten years, fifteen years, depending on the species selection again that you make. So all of this is actually highly important whenever you want to address the question on sustainability and how these projects can continue on without um, a private, uh, without funding from non-commercial uh, uh, prospects. The question of sustainability, again, I've been speaking on sustainability, but particularly looking on the carbon markets. I think uh, we currently, there is a huge gap on the finance to support, you know, non-market-based approaches because commitments are usually short term and um, there is no sustainability within uh, short-term commitments. And probably the only alternative is to make these uh, projects or um, uh, project designs really um, understand the market language, especially with the carbon um, uh, projects. And again, how to embed the sustainability on agroforestry project. Uh, at the end of the day, looking at the economical value of agroforestry itself and how the individuals who are actually uh, connected to these projects will uh, continue valuing that project is based on how uh, financially or economically viable these um, agroforestry projects will be. So the carbon market acts as a very potential uh, area where it can be exploited. But again, being on that sector, is not an easy space as how most people would think of. There is a huge challenge on um, investments to that space and it's basically because of the design. Again, um, for somebody to invest on agroforestry just to capture the carbon market, they need a very long term um, commitment on the financial investment from the beginning because they'll be undergoing operational costs before they start, before they break even and start making profits. So there is a very huge connection on all these um, aspects whenever you start designing a project for carbon sequestration and looking at the sustainability uh, aspect um, of it. Uh, but it is really important to understand agroforestry will continue being a very basic and important aspect uh, based on the how land distribution is done, but also ownership. And there are quite a number of uh, positive importances of agroforestry. These might include economic or environmental and social benefits for the locals who are actually the uh, owners and have uh, land rights over those spaces where agroforestry will take place. But there's also the benefits for global climatic and global society, which is mainly embedded within the, um, as a agroforestry being considered as a climate mitigation, um, climate change mitigation measure or control. This is all a global phenomenon. Agroforest also allows the increase of uh, carbon dioxide uptake through improved land use plan and management uh, practices. At the end of the day, um, there's, there's barely um, any additional land where people can simply expand because of the land use practices. Agroforestry simply makes sure the the remaining parts of uh, land that we have are sustainably used to maximize potential for economics, but also uh, food production and all other aspects. Um, agroforestry, again, to just to seal up my presentation, there are a number of uh, importances and uh, values, benefits for agroforestry. Landscape restoration, increased productivity of quality of yields, increased sustainability of agricultural production systems. There's improved soil health, ecological st stability, food security, and a number of those, including economic development for the local farmers, but also sustainable livelihood enhancement for rural communities. And these, the list can go on depending on how people see. I just uh, thought it was valuable to share these few 
um, highlights. Um, I hope this is the end of my presentation and I would like to say thank you for listening. Thank you, Azaria, for sharing the key aspects and highlighting the significant values of agroforestry. On to our next presenter, Danielle Piodo. Danielle is a professor at the Federal University of Southern Bahia, or UFSP, Dean of the Center for Training in Agroforestry Sciences and professor in the Biosystems Graduate Program, or UFSCB and the Ecology and Biodiversity Conservation Graduate Program, UESC. He holds a good doctorate from Yale University and master's, grad, master's degree from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Tropical Agricultural Research and Higher Education Center in Costa Rica. His research seeks to integrate theoretical knowledge about ecological processes in tropical forests and its application in the design of conservation production and restoration systems. Danielle, as our team prepares to put the video up, would you be interested in turning on your microphone and camera to greet everyone who are present here today? Oh, sure. I uh, thank you very much for the introduction uh, this panel, and I hope you guys enjoy the presentation and I'll be glad to answer your questions by the end of this session. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Piotto. I'm a professor uh, at the Federal University of Southern Bahia here in Brazil. And I'm going to talk today about carbon sequestration, sequestration in working landscapes of Southern Bahia, Brazil. So um, tropical forests have been uh, undergoing a very uh, rapid transformations in the tropics in you know, a lot of uh, forest degradation and also the replacement of um, natural forests by other land use is widespread in the tropics and um, some of these degraded areas uh, have been uh, abandoned the ones that not have not been used uh, uh, for agriculture and we have a lot of um, areas under um, natural regeneration in the tropics nowadays and some of these degraded areas have also been converted into agroforest systems. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a study that uh, we've been conducting here in, in, in southern Bahia, Brazil and is uh, this region is a, a very interesting like working landscape um, and working landscapes are uh, regions that uh, produce not just uh, products and 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 but also uh, environmental service. Uh, and then uh, I have this map here that shows the a part of Southern Bahia region, and uh, you see here in green um, remnants of natural forests. We have uh, mature and secondary forests, and in brown uh agroforest systems uh, most of uh shaded cocoa agroforests that we call here in, in bahia cabrucas so this is a very interesting region because we still have like a lot of natural forests and a really a uh, big block of one of the largest uh blocks of agroforests in the entire planet we're talking about more than half million hectares of agroforest systems uh in, interspersed with uh natural forest well the the research goal here is to uh quantify the contrib contribution of each um forest cover type uh in terms of for, uh, biomass and carbon stocks in the region so as i just mentioned there are, there are different kinds of forest types from mature forest secondary forests to uh production systems such as agroforest systems. So here is a map of Brazil and uh, the study region here. Uh, I'm, I'm based here in Yales and, and uh, uh, you got the different symbols for different uh, forest use types. So you have mature forest, secondary forest, uh, agroforestry, 
uh, two kinds of agroforest, conventional agroforest and, and, and the cabrucas that I'm going to explain right now. So here's the the design that uh, we used to uh, to conduct this study. Uh, we basically sampled uh, mature secondary forest. Secondary forest, we used the kernel sequence of, uh, of three age classes, 10, 25, and 40 year old. And uh, we measure uh, conventional agroforest systems that are basically areas that were degraded. So there was like bare land and then people came and planted the trees and the crops. So these conventional agroforest systems uh, include like uh, uh, timber species such as teak and mahogany and also cocoa, banana and other crops. And then the last one is the Cabruc agroforest system that's a traditional um, way to uh, plant cocoa here, here in this region where people cut down the under Back in the day, cut down the the the, the understory of the the uh, natural forest and planted cocoa underneath the canopy of the, the native species. So it's a very neat uh, production system, and and people have been using this uh, production system for more than uh, two hundred years now. Here, all right. So this is a picture of, uh, illustrating the immature forest, mostly uh, they're left like in ridges and and steep. Uh, slopes. Here a picture of uh, a conventional agroforest system. So you see the trees are planted in limes. We see here that we got rubber trees mixed with like timber species, cocoa, and we can see the bananas here, but they are here at some point. And here the the Cabruca agroforestry. So you see very large uh, remnant trees from the uh, natural forest that were left and underneath we get uh, the cocoa tree that are planted um, in the understory. So here another picture of uh, Cabruca agroforestry. All right, uh, so let's talk about the results. And so looking at the um, biomass stock of each um, land use type, we got um, mature forests, you know, like that, you know, uh, has much more biomass than any other uh, uh, forest type in the landscape. And that was expected, right? Because in the mature forest, we get uh, uh, a very old forest with uh, large trees that accumulate a lot of biomass. But we see that there's an increase here uh, in biomass in secondary forests. And perhaps, you know, like around like 100 to 120 years, we might reach the same um, level of biomass that we find in mature forests. And here um, we see the agroforest system. So you, we see that there is no difference between uh, Cabruca and the conventional agroforest systems in terms of biomass. Uh, Looking the data, you know, like uh, here the, the number of trees, uh, the density of individuals per hectare. So we see that uh, much, not natural forest used to have the inverted J distribution. And we see that here in the 10, 25, and 40 year old uh, forest, as we get to the mature forest, we're gonna find more uh, large trees. And when we compare the two agroforest systems, uh, we see that uh, in the conventional agroforest system, there are no there are no like smaller trees because we basically the, in the place of the smaller trees are all the crops. Whereas in the agroforest in Cabruca, we have like more like smaller trees mixed with the the cocoa in the understory, and we got we get also like tree legs. So the forest structure in the Cabruca agroforest is more interesting compared to the conventional agroforestry. Here, like it's showing that, uh, you know, there is an increase of uh, uh, large size uh, diameter trees in mature forests. But then when we look at the biomass, uh, we see that, you know, like most of the biomass is um, concentrated in large trees in mature forests, whereas in young secondary forests, most of the biomass is concentrated uh, in smaller trees. Um, well, so 
just like looking at the results and then uh, some like uh, points to discuss here. Uh, so basically, we found that you know the great uh, above ground biomass accumulation was in mature forest compared to any other um, forest cover type. Uh, there are other studies that that compare above ground biomass uh, between uh, natural forest and agroforest, uh, and and you know uh, there is there is no agroforest that can replace uh, natural forest, mature forest. So in working landscapes, it's very important. And that's a take home message. It's very important to keep mature forest. Uh, otherwise you're not going to be uh, maximizing, you know, like your carbon stocks, as we saw, there are much more biomass in this mature forest compared to any other um, uh, land use type. And, and obviously, uh, uh, not just like carbon accumulations higher uh, in mature forest, but also, you know, the biodiversity uh, storage, so you get much more species. So very important to keep mature forest um, in the in these working landscapes, but also very important to notice that plantation forestry and agroforests are also very important in these uh, working landscapes because they provide um, not uh, like not just um, products but also some like um, environmental services that are very important. Well, secondary forests, uh, they're very important in the landscape as well because they have, you know, like they're not, they don't have a lot of biomass stored, but they have like very like high heights of biomass accumulation. So these young forests are sequestering a lot of carbon. And this is very important uh, uh, because you have like, you know, a very dynamic forest sequestering like uh, tons of carbon. And, and that, that's an important component for sure. And these secondary forests can be the habitat for several native tree species that at some point will become, you know, like mature uh, trees in, in, a, in the mature forest. And these secondary forests can also be managed in a very productive, in, in ecological and also in economic terms. And there are some examples here in Brazil showing that we can produce timber and non-timber forest products from these secondary forests without like impacting, you know, the, the ability of this uh, forest to sequester carbon and, and conserve biodiversity. Uh, here are some a, pictures of secondary forest, so like a young secondary forest and here a 40 year old secondary forest. And some uh, fact about Cabruca, uh, so, very interesting. So we got like a lot of carbon store in Cabruca because of these remnant trees. So we still have like large trees. They're very like endemic species. They're conserved in this uh, Cabruca system. So uh, very important uh, uh, forest type as well. And they're also very important uh, connecting the fragments of uh, uh, natural forest in the landscape. So because uh, I show you that the, the, the forest structure is very like stratified. So you get like plants in different strata and then it's very good like for wildlife. And also because these are places you have a lot of fruits, not just cocoa, but many other kinds of fruits that can be used uh, as a resource for wildlife. And, and finally the um, conventional agroforest systems, uh, so where, you know, it's a very important component for sure in the landscape, because here we're talking about high productivity, you know, compared to like the Cabruca system, productivity is not that high. And then here we get like, you can produce a lot of timber, a lot of cocoa, a lot of non-timber forest products, such as rubber, for example, in a, in a uh, very like small, like unit of land. So you concentrate production, and this is very important, you know, like, in a like work, working landscape, like having portions of the landscape that you have like very high productivity. So then you can uh, use, you know, the pr products from these parts of the landscape and then, then diminish the pressure on like natural environments such as uh, mature and, and secondary forests. And there are many studies that have been pointing out that the, even these con uh, conventional, more simple agroforest systems are also like important components um, for the landscape for carbon sequestration as well. And as a conclusion, basically uh, as a recap here, so working landscapes have a great potential for carbon sequestration and storage 
for biodiverse conservation and provision of ecosystem service and also you know for, for production you know for like uh food and, and and forest products and they're also very important you know like to improve like rural livelihoods especially like in this region of uh, in the tropics for example here in bahia that there's still a lot of poverty uh, in the landscape so it's very important uh to have uh, a variety of uh, strategies so you can uh, tackle like different pro uh, problems not just forest conservation but also improving uh, uh, the life quality in, in rural areas and providing ecosystem service for for urban areas so basically, uh, the, the that would be uh, pretty much uh, what I have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor da Daniel, for imparting your knowledge on working landscapes. Reminding everyone that you could submit your questions in our Q and A session. And. Uh, we go now on to meeting our final presenter for this session. Siko Stortelder is the head of the agroforestry hub of Acorn. He has ample experience in nature-based solutions projects for smallholders and businesses in the tropical world, in particular in Latin America and Africa. He has a forestry degree from Wageningen University and further established a native tree Plantation Company in Peru. Let's welcome Sika Stortelder. Um, Sika, would you like to activate your uh, microphone and say hello to our participants? Thank you, Ira. Uh, everybody, a warm welcome, of course, to this uh, webinar. Um, I'm very happy to see so many participants, over 100. Uh, of course, the topic is also uh, asking for a lot of attention. Uh, Agroforestry, of course, one of the key solutions to uh, improve uh, both our the sustainability of our food systems and also has a great impact on uh, on carbon uh, uh, reductions of course so um, i'm very happy that we have so much uh, uh, participants and uh, i hope you uh, can uh, learn something from it i'm also learning from from the other uh, um, uh, speakers so uh, also looking forward to the question and answer sessions Hello, my name is Siko Strottelder. Uh, I'm working as a head of Equiforestry Hub for ACORN. ACORN is a program, uh, Equiforestry program uh, from the Rago Bank. I'm, uh, uh, thank you all for uh, um, uh, joining this presentation. Uh, the topic of the presentation is designing Equiforestry uh, systems for carbon. Um, my title of the presentation is Seeing the Equiforest for the Carbon. And I will surely dive into that topic to understand what I mean with that. Briefly, uh, an overview of, uh, of the content that I will discuss in this presentation. Um, we're first going to uh, focus on uh, agroforestry approach, how we see uh, agroforestry um, within ACORN, but also from a personal perspective. Um, biomass in trees, of course, a crucial element for uh, dealing with this topic. Uh, looking at carbon revenues from uh, agroforestry uh, and carbon sequestration. And how do we also relate to uh, the, the wider carbon re revenues, uh, the wider revenue stream of agroforestry designs, and some uh, concluding remarks. So, um, very briefly, first of all, uh, Acorn. Um, Acorn is a, a large uh, agroforestry program for smallholders, uh, where we uh, assist smallholders in transitioning from monocultures to uh, agroforestry systems. Uh, we have set up certification system whereby um, we certify uh, large-scale agroforestry programs in the global south, uh, where with a new technology with remote sensing uh, satellites, uh, we are able to, sec uh, to monitor biomass increases on uh, all small plots uh, scattered across the landscapes. One of the nice things of this program is that we focus purely on smallholders, and also the, that smallholders receive a very fair revenue share from the carbon, uh, which in our case means that 80% of all the car carbon credits that are being sold uh, via the Rabobank, 80% of the revenue goes to the smallholders. Uh, and this is, I think, quite unique and also in relation to the focus on uh, smallholders uh, and, uh, and the assistance we provide with that uh, makes it a very nice program, we, which uh, is, is very nice to work for. Now, looking at uh, our approach towards uh, agroforestry, so 
we see it as an holistic approach where we look at agroforestry in a larger setting of uh, benefits that can be generated both for the farmers and for the landscape. Because if I would focus purely on the economic part and saying, okay, let's do agroforestry for uh, carbon revenues, uh, let's grow trees that are fast, very fast growing, uh, have a high uh, wood density, uh, can capture a lot of carbon. Of course, that's possible. Uh, but it's also kind of a limited view on uh, what agroforestry is meant for. Agroforestry, the, the, the whole concept itself is that uh, you have a, you transform to a system which is uh, incorporates a lot of factors, not just a single goal such as carbon, but many multiple goals. And, and here I've included uh, quite, uh, quite many of them. We have, of course, in the economic sphere, carbon, but also uh, other revenue streams from of course, fruits from nuts, uh, from crops. Uh, sometimes also to product certification, you can fetch higher prices. Uh, you have the element of farm productivity, which is very crucial as well. How can you ensure that your yields and that your production, uh, not just in the short term, but also in the long term, um, is very beneficial uh, in your system? And how can you use trees and plants, and other hedges, shrubs to ensure that these yields uh, high, are high, are stable uh, and contribute to healthy crops. There's a social element to, to agroforestry, which uh, of course in our projects is also very important, uh, which relates to health, uh, which relates to uh, gender roles, which relates to food security. Um, well, uh, farm boundaries, I think is also very important uh, because often exactly the farm boundary can be used as well as uh, a way to integrate trees in the landscape. Uh, the component of soil and water, uh, of course, with integrating trees on, the, on your farm, you can increase soil water quality in, in many uh, aspects. And last but not least, the environmental part of which carbon is, of course, also part of, but of course, also looking at the biodiversity. Uh, we are in the middle of a biodiversity crisis in the world. Uh, you need to look at air quality. Uh, you look at uh, uh, reducing soil erosion. Uh, you also look at optimizing in a way your yields in a farm uh, make it very productive so you also don't need to use much more land uh, one of the reasons why uh, deforestation occurs in the land is because we are not very efficient with land use and also for that reason agroforestry is interesting to implement now um, agroforestry what can it contribute to carbon sequestration so therefore we i first want to look at uh the tree itself uh, and where the carbon is actually stored in so we have basically uh two areas uh two carbon pools so to say uh, uh to which the, the the tree is contributing with carbon that's the above ground biomass and the below ground biomass the above ground biomass consists of the leaves trunks and the branches and the below ground biomass consists of the roots uh, of course, apart from this, uh, this, uh, this living biomass, uh, you have also uh, um, uh, dead, uh, dead wood, uh, litter, humus layers. You have also carbon in, uh, in the soil. Uh, but in this case, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm focusing uh, for this slide on uh, carbon captures in trees. And what you also see in the, in the, in the bar chart is that this, this relation towards how much biomass is in the stem, in the branches and the leaves is also changing over time according to the age of the trees. That's something also important to take into account. If you look at how much carbon is actually stored in, for example, 100 trees after 20 years, 100 trees is, is quite a regular and normal uh, uh, amount of trees when you, for example, talk about uh, cocoa or coffee agroforestry systems. You can actually see there is a big difference between what type of tree you plant, what species. Uh, here you see that cocoa captures around 30 to 40 tons of carbon after 20 years for 100 trees. Uh, citrus uh, trees uh, often are a bit smaller, uh, have also a different uh, form of the sh uh, shape of the trees. Cashew can be growing quite tall, has a bigger absorption rate, but in particular native forest trees, uh, in this case we, we plotted Carapa guianensis, uh, a fast growing tree from uh, uh, Latin America, those can really grow tall, grow a lot in terms of diameters as well, have big root systems, and these kind of trees are the ones that can really capture a lot of carbon. On the in the field and also act at the same time as uh, with other benefits such as providing shade for crops. 
So not all trees are the same. There are a big difference between what kind of trees you plant and how much carbon they can capture. Now I'm referring, now I'm getting to my point and, and uh, why I called this presentation seeing the aquifers for the carbon. Because additional carbon income can be really significant, uh, especially if you are a smallholder farmer with uh, limited revenue from your crop yields. Um, and of course, uh, in a program like a program like Acorn, where a farmer receives eighty percent of the cre credits uh, uh, in revenue, uh, this can be significant. But still, the amount of money that a farmer can make, uh, even with high prices such as thirty euros per ton, which uh, we often sell uh, carbon for in Acorn, uh, the the total amount of money a farmer can make. Uh, with the carbon is relatively limited compared to what he can make from uh, the, sell, the sale of uh, the yields of his crops, which could be coffee, cacao, citrus trees, uh, citrus products, uh, nuts uh, like cashew or uh, macadamia. So that's very important to, to take into account that um, and where, where we also want to understand that when you support a farmer with planting trees, it must. It is very important to look at that his yield from his cash crops, the yield from uh, all the, 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 the annual crops that he possibly has, is not affected by uh, the additional planting of trees. It should be uh, uh, going parallel in that sense. Um, in it, over here, we have an, uh, the orange bar, for example, is indicating uh, how much revenue, additional revenue, we can get from uh, carbon revenues. And that is, as you can see, a smaller proportion from the total bar. Now we get to the uh, designs. Um, many people ask, oh, what's a good design? Uh, what tree species do I need to plant? Well, I think there's some general rule. There is no perfect blueprint aquaforestry design, but there are very good questions to ask to get to a good design. And I'm summing up here some of the questions that I think are relevant to uh, ask when you uh, want to develop an agroforestry design. First of all, you have to look what is your baseline of your uh, agroforestry plot. Is that, for example, pasture land? Is that an existing cocoa plantation? Is that a, uh, does it already have a lot of shade in the system, for example? How is the soil fertility looking like? Is it a very degraded land? Uh, does it have good humus layers? Um, is it uh, uh, is it depleted in a way? And of course, you need to look at, uh, is there any access from the farmer, uh, by the farmer currently for seedlings or not? Then also crucial is, what is the farmer interest? Does he have an interest in uh, subsistence crops? Is it a relatively poor farmer that needs to increase food and nutrition for his family and for himself? Uh, is he a very commercial focused farmer that needs a uh, usual way is, uh, for example, producing a lot of coffee from his farm um, and that needs to be increased and that, or that should be maintained? Or is it, okay, I already have quite a good system in my uh, producing a lot of coffee in my, in, my, in my farm and I just want to add another uh, uh, revenue stream, for example, from carbon. There could, of course, also be many other factors. Yeah, I'm just naming a few. What, what could be the interest of a farmer here? Another important element to take into account, what is the size of the plot? Um, if you have uh, a relatively small plot, for example, half a hectare, three quarters of a hectare, maybe one hectare, and you are depending on that uh, as a living, as a smallholder farmer, you really want to make sure that you optimize the conditions for the cash crops and also the cash crop trees if they are part of the farm, for example, uh, a cashew tree or a, a cocoa tree. Um, because it doesn't make uh, uh too much sense to say oh i have for example uh, 900 cocoa plants in my farm uh, that is where my main production and my income comes from i'm gonna uh, remove uh, many trees of those and i'm gonna plant carbon trees instead uh, it must be a balance there um, because the carbon in general is not worth that much yet to compensate for um, uh, in terms of income from from the cash crop uh, that he has if you have a bit of a larger plot, but even a plot like a hectare, you can often uh, uh, do very much with your boundaries and your uh, uh, because they are on the side of the farm, they are often already 
fen uh, a fencing line uh, with neighboring farms or, or other areas. You can use them as living fences, you can use them as windbreaks, you can use them as fire breaks. And of course, having them as a tree line also has a social function of showing uh, uh, the land tenure that or the land use that the farmer has, uh, keeping animals out, for example. So the boundary is often a crucial element which you, which you can benefit uh, for planting trees. Then the environment. Of course, you need to select trees and uh, crops that fit the environment and, and, and the farmer and the market needs. Uh, there are, of course, many uh, elements in, the, in terms of environmental factors. Uh, to name a few, uh, the climate and the temperatures, the level of rainfalls, uh, the soil conditions, uh, the altitude, but also looking ahead in the future. Will there be a very big expected climate change in terms of and a lot, uh, a large drought periods? Will the climate, uh, the temperatures be way higher uh, or is that relatively stable? Will there be a lot less or more rain? Of course, sometimes very difficult to get hard data on and, and uh, climate modulations come with a lot of uncertainties, but it is good to look at it and take into account for your trees because once planted, uh, you expect them to be there for decades. Markets, that's a crucial element, of course, as well. Uh, do you want to focus on a single cash crop or are you, or is the farmer or your project interested in developing other crop value chains? Now looking at some design options, and I'm going to just give a very simple uh, overview of, of a couple of ideas, uh, but I think it's also important to take into account uh, because uh, it determines a lot on which crops you can grow and uh, how much shade they, uh, your trees going to provide, whether uh, certain trees or crops are competing for space or for nutrients or for light conditions, which of course determine a lot on how they will grow and how productive they will be. So the first one, as I already mentioned, the boundary planting I consider as very important, in particular for those projects that produce crops that require a lot of light. For example, think of maize, think of sugarcane, think of uh, grains. These are crops that are, need a lot of sunlight, need to do a lot of production based on photosynthesis, and therefore you're, uh, you don't want to have too many trees within your farmland and you better plant around the farm. Uh, another nice uh, hint there is to plant trees in the west-east direction if you, if you don't want to bring too much shade into your system because the sun of course goes from east to west uh, uh, all over the earth uh, and thereby the shade of the trees, uh, are, if you put them in the same line, uh, they will provide shade to each other rather than on the uh, farmland itself. Alley cropping is, of course, a very uh, famous system within agroforestry where you can intermix um, uh, both trees or hedges together with annual crops. And of course, we have fruit, nut, tree, or charge. Uh, you can make a lot of tip the layouts there. Uh, and often you, you have, very important is, of course, the spacing, spacing of the trees. Take that into account and see what kind of trees um, you can include in the system and uh, look very well as well at what kind of strata these trees will be occupying. If you have a, a tree such as, well, I see a hazelnut here, uh, uh, they may be uh, 5 to 10 meters tall, for example. Uh, if you have a tree which, which you plant, which has the same height, then of course there will be a competition in the strata, which is not so favorable for, uh, for your system. So think that through before planting. Um, another example, and I think this is uh, uh, also good to, to remember, is that, uh, and here we take the example of cocoa agroforestry, that the shade requirements of a certain crop, they differ, they can differ over time. And cocoa is a nice example of that. For example, a cocoa plant in the first two years requires a lot of shade. Uh, the leaves are re relatively uh, uh, fragile and uh, shade is really a necessity for them growing well. You, you, the recommendation is to have about 60 to 70 percent of shade. How do you do that? Well, think of planting banana before a year earlier, so they are tall, if six months earlier, so they are a bit tall, provide shade, and the cocoa can develop well uh, in the first years. Once you get into later stages, you really want to have uh, less, less shade in your system, 
which you can do with pioneer species and then you can think ahead after 10 years to have more secondary climax trees in your system which are relatively tall and provide uh, shade uh, at uh, in, in high uh, uh, at high canopies so this is um, uh, i think crucial to always think through how will my tree look like uh, at certain uh, moments uh, uh, in the time uh, over the coming decades and uh, also uh, when it comes to carbon markets uh, there is an increasing focus on the durability the permanence of carbon in your system so you also want to plant trees that uh, store a lot of carbon for a long time um, uh, but you can also uh, if there is a system where you also want to use timber for example from your from your farm uh, there are also some systems where this is possible and you have special methodologies where you can account for the harvesting of timber trees in your project um, but it's also important then to take into account uh, that these timber trees on the one hand they will have a negative impact of course on the carbon levels of a, of a certain project it will lower the total carbon revenues in your system timber trees may also affect uh, and damage cash crops when you're going to harvest them imagine a, a thick uh, a 40 centimeter thick tree that you that you cut in a uh, in a coffee plantation there will be many co coffee crops damaged if you uh, just let it fall anyway um, but it's also important to take these things into consideration from the very first moment on and and when designing and planting a project because uh, they will have its uh, uh, repercussions over 10 or 20 years when you, for example, cut down a tree in a, uh, in, a in an arc forestry pro uh, project. Overall, uh, I think uh, my, my main message is take advantage of all upsides of agroforestry. And of course, I haven't dived into that much, but I'll give you a bit uh, uh, some things that I think are key when it comes to benefits of agroforestry. For example, the leaf litter of the trees, of the uh, of the bushes uh, that can fertilize the soil, can also help for mulching of your crops. Uh, of course, generating these humus layers uh, uh, of the of the tree branches and the leaves enhances the soil health and the and the, the soil life, uh, like the worms, uh, uh, like the beetles, uh, all kind of. Um, uh, fungi that are present and have a network in the soil that really support the the health of the of the trees and the crops in your soil in your in your farm of course carbon sequestration uh, I've talked about that uh, look at pollination advantages many farms <coughs> in in, uh, in 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 the global south uh, they lack productivity also because uh, pollination is is not optimal and of course, if you can be a host for bees and for other uh, insects that pollinate, that can really help to contribute um, uh, yields of your uh, of your of your fruit or, or nut trees. Soil erosion reduce. Of course, you can reach a lot of soil erosion reduction with planting uh, the right trees. Uh, also, study the trees that you plant, uh, which one are really good and uh, have certain root networks that limit the effects of soil erosion of course a cooler microclimate is important that can be both important for crops and then the lower lower strata cash crops but it can also be very important for uh for the farmers and the and the people uh, themselves that work in in the farm we have increasing te increasing temperatures all over the planet and this topic is increasingly important as well just to have a cool climate conditions to work in of course, it comes with the benefit of diversified and stable yields. Uh, it is it is um, proven that with agroforestry practices, with improving this uh, better quality soil, that over time you need way less fertilizer, artificial fertilizer, to keep crop uh, productivity stable. Uh, so an agroforestry system is may not be the the solution uh, for um, uh, for the for reducing uh, artificial fertilizers in the first couple of years, but it will be uh, 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 significant effects when you are getting into later years and when you really your soil after uh, after quite some years has really recovered. 
And one of the messages that, of course, I bring is that uh, don't be blindfolded by the carbon in that sense in the, in the agroforestry system. Let carbon be a part of a holistic approach where you look at all the many benefits that the agroforestry system brings uh, for the farmers, uh, for uh, flora and fauna, uh, for the soil life. From my perspective, uh, this should be a nice add-on, a nice cherry on top in many systems. Um, uh, that can contribute to additional revenue streams and can contribute to the uh, mitigation of, uh, of climate effects. Uh, but for me, the main message is the, the yields of farmers are often the most important element in ensuring that the yields are high, and that they are stable and that they are coming from uh, uh, preferably uh, uh, natural cycles of uh, um, uh, of biomass being decomposed uh, from trees into the soil, etc., uh, is very important. Um, that was my presentation for today. Um, final slide to mention that we have a, uh, a newsletter from Acorn you can subscribe on our website. We also have a YouTube channel recently set up where we also share webinars that we organize as Ecoforestry Hub about, of course, Ecoforestry topics. Feel free to subscribe and and, and watch those. Uh, and with that, my uh, uh, come to the main topic of uh, if there are any questions. And uh, of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the rich information on certification system and good agroforestry design, Zico. Um, yeah, before anything else, I would like to ask the speakers if they have something to say or comment on each other's presentations. Hello, Irie. Hi, Azaria. Can you? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure whether you can all hear me, but I think I wanted to seal up on what um, the last presenter actually said. So um, the notion on carbon uh, credits and trading has been taking over the globe for a number of reasons. And usually it's based on the financial incentive that simply adds on on the um, results of carbon. However, with the agroforestry system, it's really important to understand the market for carbon credits, actually a unique market with a lot of complexities. And that shouldn't really override the fact that what we are looking with agroforestry is how important the yields are actually addressed and how this farmer is actually doing a practice embedded with his own interest uh, rather than focusing on the carbon um, space itself. So agroforestry should, look, should be looked at a broader broader picture and not really narrowing down on the carbon credit scheme as we we have seen things uh, happen. So I really wanted to um, second on what he just uh, said, and I think it's really important for practitioners to understand that. Thanks for the comment, Azaria. Anything you would like to share, Danielle and Zico? Um, yes. Uh... No, I just wanted uh, to add that, uh, you know, like uh, looking in the three talks, you know, we're, we're talk we have like different perspectives and, and actually, you know, there are lots, lots of trade-offs, uh, you know, so you, if you want a more carbon, you're going to, you need to give like more on the crop side. And, and so there are uh, several trade-offs and there's also like a matter of scale. So you can always uh, look at the farm or you can look at the landscape and include other land use in, in the kind of agroforest pack for a carbon project. Because as uh, I think everybody noticed uh, in the presentations, uh, we're talking about like small scale, like interventions and in carbon marks, markets, we're talking about, you know, like scale, like a lot of carbon. Uh, and so I think that that's very important uh, take home message too is that, you know, to make the carbon scheme work uh, for agroforestry, we need a very uh, coordinated movement among farmers uh, to get like scale and, and, and negotiate like good price. And that's it, thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, thanks uh, for, the, for the comments. Uh, uh, I, th I think it's uh, the whole carbon market has been gone through uh, quite a uh, well revolution, maybe to, to say uh, the least, uh, 
over the past decades and we're still there's still a lot of learnings to do and a lot of improvements to be made uh, um, uh, well which are taking place within the certifying agencies within the regulatory bodies uh, but also among um, uh, of course project implementers and uh, I think there are many approaches uh, uh, and I think we it's, it's mostly uh, exactly these kind of channels where we can learn from each other and uh, and see what what can work in certain areas uh, what uh, what people are uh, uh, implementing uh, there's often a bit of a you know there have been a lot of quite some studies on agroforestry uh, um, especially from the academia in in, in in the past but when you come to like real large-scale implementation of agroforestry it's often so limited and there have been very few uh, long-term uh, uh, studies being done on agroforestry systems so sometimes our our knowledge base is very fragmented, and uh, uh, that is something I, I really hope that can also improve over the over the coming time. Uh, in particular, because of all the carbon uh, interest, which I think is really a catalyst for uh, can be really a catalyst both for uh, agroforestry but also both for forest projects, of course. Again, we extend our heartful gratitude to Zico, Daniel, and Nazaria for dedicating their time to give wonderful and informative presentations on agroforestry and carbon, and for being present today to address our questions. Speaking of questions, uh, so far we have received some excellent questions from our attendees. Um, first question would be about carbon credits. So carbon credits are currently driving the interest in agroforestry systems. How do you manage the expectations of the communities since many agroforestry species got different sequestration capabilities and also take a long time to begin sequestration? No, uh, who's gonna start? Uh, it's an well. Uh, actually, I I don't really think like carbon is really the motivation like uh, to get agroforestry systems on the ground. Um, you know, like if if you look at the economics and 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 Siko presented like uh, a little graph of that. We you look at like some like income from carbon, but then it's kind of marginal. And there's a lot of the, there's the transaction costs. There are a bunch of things that you know. Uh, uh, my, um, you know, like it's not like the main motivation. That's my take. At least down here, uh, uh, farmers. I mean, we have like half a million hectares of agroforest, and and we don't have like a carbon scheme like operating in the landscape, and we keep like getting. We we need like you know like uh we need like a sustainable source of like timber so there are many other uh, drivers i would say not just carbon but for sure carbon is another important component yeah maybe it might can uh, also my perspective uh so yeah the topic of carbon can sometimes be a bit theoretical um and uh in pharma communications uh i think one of the uh you you must make it very uh, uh, yeah so maybe simple or down to earth so to say saying okay look if you have a, a certain tree and you would for example uh, uh, cut it and you would uh, put it on a on a weighting scale or you would lift it uh, the heavier it is the more carbon of course it uh, it contains more or less and uh, I think that's that's kind of these, these kind of simple approaches where we have to see in our projects also with farmer messaging material uh, and doing trainings that uh, indeed there is a large difference between the type of species that people plant and how much carbon does it really capture. Uh, but I totally agree also with, with Daniel, the carbon shouldn't be the main motivator in this uh, for, for planting the trees. And it should be a nice, uh, yeah, you, you plant a tree, uh, for example, because you need the shade or it's a nitrogen fixing species or it, uh, it acts as a, as a windbreak, for example, in your farm. And then the carbon is some nice addition to the whole, uh, to the whole system, especially, of course, when you have it uh, certified and you get payments for it. Thank you, Siko and Daniel. Another question that we have from the attendees. Um, 
Technical assistance in agroforestry is very expensive in Brazil. What does ACORN do to facilitate the spread of knowledge in Brazil and uh, making the question more broad, like beyond Brazil? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, actually in Brazil, we are uh, starting also with uh, uh, a few projects there. Uh, one is that is already uh, uh, starting is uh, one in Mato Grosso do Sur. Uh, where we uh, have an agreement with uh, with a small uh, pharma organization uh, called Copper Apoms, uh, where one of the challenging projects, in a way, because indeed it is very much much more expensive than in other parts of the world, just because of the the, the income levels, for example, in Brazil, and it the business case in itself is, there is much more complex because. Uh, we look at, okay, the carbon revenues, of course, the carbon revenues from a system in Brazil may be more or less equal than, uh, for example, one in uh, one in Peru, but of course, your costs are much higher. So where there we had, for example, uh, encountered a structure to also that not only ACORN is uh, uh, financing a part of, of the implementation, but also that the local government is chipping in with money and also that a local uh, that a, a credit facility uh, from uh, from a bank is uh, chipping in with money. So actually, actually in that project we had three revenue sources to uh, to make the project work. And you need that kind of creative solution, uh, especially in those countries where the cost of implementation is relatively high. Uh, and just to give also an idea, uh, what what makes it expensive? Uh, uh, compare, for example, the cost of fruit trees, which are often grafted, which are relatively expensive. They may be costing one or 1.5 or even two or three dollars per, per species per seedling uh, while the other trees that are um, uh, well, for example a glyricidia tree or a forest tree they are relatively cheap to produce uh, uh, it could maybe cost half a dollar so uh, you always need to look at the balance okay how many expensive uh, trees i'm going to plant in the project and how much relatively uh, inexpensive trees i'm going to plant in the project and that's really something on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, I would say. Thank you, Zico. Um, another question for open to all of our uh, speakers. Based on your experiences, how much are the implementation costs of a small-scale agroforestry carbon project in your region? For example, East Africa for Azaria. Do you think the current prices for ARR project, projects reflect the actual cost needed to implement a high quality project on the ground. Uh, thanks, Harry. That's uh, quite an interesting question. And that's, to be honest, I have really never worked out the costing for implementing such projects. But from my um, forestry based experience with a carbon project, I think that should be really high. And um, usually because of a number of dynamic things that uh, happen with agroforestry and uh, carbon crediting. And as other presenters have actually spoken about the amount of uh, carbon that your space can squash, so that is the basic um, uh, the basic aspect that you consider for a credit to be made. So understanding how much carbon your, your space actually sequesters and the cost that's related to all other related activities that you have to implement, definitely the uh, carbon project for agroforestry projects will definitely be um, practically expensive but also really hard for people to invest because normally they will take a long time for um, investors to break even and start making profit but also there are a number of things that should be looked at and now i think it's important for me to say the whole carbon space is really a solid thing where you look at it separately different from all these um, other aspects we're looking at. So uh, coming back to what we have said so far, I think it's important to look at agroforestry, putting into account all these other additional benefits that um, an individual can get rather than looking at uh, carbon itself. And carbon should just be seen as you know a cherry on the top, as uh, uh, my colleague said. It's a small thing on the variety of things that you actually attain from uh, agroforestry practices. So, yeah. Any takes on that, Zico and Dania? Well, um, yeah, you know, like uh, the question was like, you, you have like a, a small, like scale agroforestry, uh, and the, I mean, the 
is the transaction cost like worthwhile to like to you know to apply for carbon credits and I don't think so, you know. So that's the kind of the complicated thing about agroforestry because when you get like large scale operations, I mean that's very rare, uh, as Sito said. And here in Brazil, we have some examples. Um, very rare, and in even these like big uh, projects, you know, uh, they're very like incipient and new. So agroforestry large scale is not like usual down here in the tropics and. And I think, you know, the only way you can get, you know, like small farmers into the carbon markets, is they, you know, like they got to have a contemporary cooperative or some sort of like work, working together to get, you know, like a, a area that makes sense to apply for carbon. Uh, because as someone said here, I mean, the transaction cost is super high. And, and so we're talking about scale again, yeah. Yeah. Irie, can I ask a follow-up to that to Siko? Uh, so Siko, given what Daniel just said about again, grouping people together with cooperatives and whatnot, is that something that Acorn's been doing um, to group different landholders together uh, into their own entities or through their involvement with Acorn? Yeah, good question. Uh, so uh, how we work with Acorn is that we uh, we do uh, alliances with uh, what we call local partners, which are typically uh, farmer cooperatives, it can be NGOs, uh, uh, in some occasions also companies, which have uh, basically the connections to large farmer networks. Um, and uh, what we see is, yeah, we at Acorn really focus on large large scale projects. Uh, in in Latin America, we do just the name. We we say minimum three thousand hectares. In Africa, the the bar is much higher even. Um, and what we uh, what we see is that local partners think through ways of how to incorporate such large farmer groups. Uh, either by within their own farmer network, sometimes by cooperating with other organizations or with uh, uh, yeah, certain uh, regional structures that exist uh, among farmers, often is very much tied to a value chain. So, for example, oh, you have a coffee cooperative, they may be grouping together uh, many, many coffee farmers also from other regions. Uh, so you can get scale in these projects. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, that's also where, uh, uh, in a way, it's... Uh, it's very nice and, and uh, additional, but also impactful because many of the past projects in with agroforestry, they haven't been able to reach much scale. And uh, that's also, uh, um, yeah, maybe part of it is, of course, uh, uh, people's understanding and, and the, even the political agenda of uh, uh, focusing on, on typical uh, agriculture practices. Uh, but it's also, um, because uh, yeah, many many of the organizations uh, they may want to they have an interest maybe in doing this, but they cannot get the finance. And uh, especially with now this this new carbon market, there is uh, uh, finance for doing large scale projects. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's how we uh, are also uh, uh, are working to uh, to upscale agroforestry around the world. Thanks, Hiko. And I'd say the same question for Azaria, too. Are there, is there work that you're doing to bring together different farmers and landholders? Uh, well, particularly with us, we, we haven't um, had any project that's working with, with farmers. And um, uh, as Hiko says, I think the uh, main complexity is how you mobilize these people and acquire a reasonable space where somebody can invest on you know so the the carbon counting methodologies and the practices itself the standards itself they are you know they're really robust and they are highly demanding and at times mobilizing individual farmers to come up with a very big space where you you're able to squeeze a number um, a huge amount of uh, carbon itself and to create enough credits for one to invest on and be able to break even it's it's all on a question of how investments and finances um, business corporate finances actually operate so we we as a company, we only work with, uh, you know, intact forest reserves, and these are mostly community. And it's way easier when we work with a community level engagement rather than individuals who require an extra uh, activity of mobilizing them, as Siko says, whether they're working in, you know, farmer unions or they have a bigger body that brings them together because there's 
a number of things that a number of risks that an investor a carbon crediting investor will be looking at before they start engaging on a carbon credit there's another question here directed to danielle uh danielle is that uh, given that Cabruca has lower productivity than conventional agroforestry, what is the incentive for farmers to grow in Cabruca? Why do they do it? Also, have you measured plant and animal diversity compared with Cabruca with convention agroforest? All right. A uh, bunch of little questions. Uh, uh, okay, so... So uh, there are very different systems, uh, you know, in terms of labor, for example. Uh, Cabruca is, you know, is, a, is like a low intensive uh, labor. Uh, there's, you just need like to weed uh, the, sometimes the, the, the cocoa plantation and, but uh, it's not that labor intensive compared uh, to the traditional uh, agroforest where managing like lots of crops at the same time, you know, timber uh, species, managing bananas and cassava and cocoa. So it's much more uh, labor intensive. So uh, here in, in this region, you're gonna have like the, these intense, intensive agroforestry systems, uh, they're gonna have like it's kind of smaller area. So whereas like for Cabruca, a farmer, can, one family can take care of around like five hectares of Cabruca. While uh, in this conventional agroforest, one family would handle like one to two hectares of it. So uh, very different um, in terms of labor. Um, and then, you know, like that reflects in the productivity, right? So we're managing like a larger area, but getting like less cocoa per, per unit of hair. But at the end of the day, you might be getting um, similar amounts of cocoa, but managing different uh, areas. And the question about uh, biodiversity, uh, biodiversity, they're, they're like uh, researchers down here that have been doing like a great job, like monitoring um, biodiversity. So they've been monitoring different groups like birds and mammals and insects. And, and there are very lots of articles like uh, in the literature, but, but basically, you know, the uh, is like the most like friendly uh, say productive system uh, compared to any other uh, in the region. So you're gonna find like endangered species like uh, the golden faced tamarind, for example, uh, living in this uh, kabuka. So we, I haven't measured, but this is plenty of literature uh, showing that they're very important for, for wildlife as well. Thank you for the answers, Daniel. And next, what are the top three implementation practices for regenerative agroforestry systems that could yield observable benefits in the short to medium term? This is open for all of our speakers. And just to repeat for our speakers, the, the question, what are the top three implementation practices for regenerative agroforestry systems that could yield observable benefits in the short or medium term? So some of that uh, you talked about in your lectures, but if you have any comments that you want to share now in response to this question. Yeah, oh, let, let me... Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Siko. Oh, I'll, I'll try something. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, of course, uh, regenerative agriculture is a bit more a broader term than agroforestry. Uh, so that's, uh, <laughs> that of course, uh, yeah, regenerative agriculture practice you can do in a non-agroforestry system. Um, so it's a bit broader, I would say. But yeah, think of throw with agroforestry, obviously, is the, the planting of trees. Uh, uh, with, with regenerative ag agriculture, there is quite a focus on uh, reducing of uh, tillage in systems. So the soil is being kept uh, quite stable uh, and not interrupted. The coil, so carbon stays well in the ground. Um, uh, there's no little compaction of the soil. So I think in general, all the things that you do with soil, uh, both in regenerative agriculture practice, but also in agroforestry practices, very much relate. You really want to keep the soil as best intact as possible, increase humus layers, 
reduce, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, artificial pesticides, herbicides, focus on biopesticides if possible, take advantage of, uh, uh, of the benefits, specific ecological benefits of trees. Uh, I already named the nitrogen fixation properties of certain trees, which can reduce uh, artificial fertilizers as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, typical practices such as uh, 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 mulching uh, is important. What else can I think of? Yeah, that's what comes into uh, pops into my mind right now. Uh, please, uh, please continue, Daniel. Uh, I agree with you, Zico. Uh, you know, it's a different uh, system, uh, and you know, uh, and again, it, uh, you know, there are varieties of agroforestry systems uh, in, in this region, but here, for example, like, you know, there's a gradient of agroforestry from the Cabruca and, you know, the syntropic systems they call. It. And then, you know, uh, there are lots of trade-offs. So they're like very simple ones with like a couple of species and then you get a gradient with more species and, and more complex uh, management schemes and, uh, and like, you know, these regenerative agricultural systems are, are the most complex for sure. So uh, there are several benefits, but I mean, the caveats that uh, it's how to scale up this kind of thing, you know, like uh, we're talking about very small uh, uh, farmers that can really like process that in a kind of in the proper way so uh, but it's very rare to find like you know like large scale um regenerative agriculture uh, in this region and i guess all over the tropics it's a new thing uh lots of benefits for sure but uh, there's a lot of science uh i mean there can be uh, you know people talk a lot but i i feel that there is uh there's a need for re more research and you know like in this uh field as well um uh, not not just uh, uh looking at the benefits but also looking at the economics and and all the socio dynamics of these things thank you I'm delighted to say that we are having a rich dialogue. Unfortunately, we're running on short time. Uh, attendees, rest assured that we are compiling the questions, your questions, um, for the 25th. So please be back on April 25th. It's a session dedicated to cover all of your questions. Once more, thank you to our speakers for participating in today's event and for imparting their expertise to our global audience. And to everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today and for listening to the presentation all throughout the session. Before we conclude, we have a few announcements. Don't forget to visit the events page on our website and subscribe to our mailing list to stay updated on all LT's upcoming events. Additionally, please remember that today's session has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow. You can also explore our channel to watch some of our previous webinar series. Um, the first series is already uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel. Join us next week on April 18th, as we welcome Emma Van de Ven, the Head of Strategy of Knowledge and Networks, Rabobank Acorn, Netherlands, together with Peter Umunai, the Senior Environmental Specialist of Global Environmental Facility here at the United States, to be moderated by Emmy Nicholson, Online Training Associate of LTYSC. They will be talking on connecting agroforestry projects to the carbon market. Finally, on behalf of the Agroforestry and Carbon Webinar Planning Committee, I extend our sincerest gratitude to everyone who joined us today. For more information, please visit our website or send us an email. Thank you and take care. We look forward to seeing you at the same time next week. Goodbye.